We're in week number four of this Scars and Band-Aids series. It's been a great series, impactful and relatable, because I think all of us have got some scar stories, don't we? And, and I will start with one that's a lighthearted one, a, a funny one. I have a son named Deacon. I named him that because I thought it was a funny name for a preacher's kid. You've heard me say that before maybe, but he's 17 years old now. And he's about to graduate from high school. But when he was about five years old, we used to go to this Mexican restaurant. He called it Chips and Sauce. It was his favorite place to eat. We went there almost every Sunday after church. And reliably, when we would go in this place, the restaurant would be full almost entirely of people we went to church with. We knew everybody in there. And so we went in there. Amy got a table. That's my wife. And... Of course, those of you got little kids, you know how that goes. Deacon had to go to the restroom right when we got there. So I took him to the restroom, and while he's in there doing his thing, those of you that know me at all, no big surprise, I'm out working the room. I'm talking to the people that I know. And, and Deacon gets done uh, with that in there, and he comes over to me, and I said, look, um, Amy's probably, my wife's probably going to be annoyed. Your mom's going to be annoyed a little bit because I want to take too long. So if you could go back over to the table where she is, tell her to order me something, and, and I will be there in just a minute. And that was... The best dad, not necessarily, but it was, it was a good parenting decision in the moment because Deacon's five years old, and guess what he did? He took off running, full speed ahead, sprint right across the most crowded restaurant through the bar area, and I could see him going, and then I could also see coming around the corner, there was this shorter waitress lady carrying a big round tray, and it was piled over with dishes that she'd cleared, piled so high she couldn't see over it or around it. And she's coming unrespons irresponsibly fast also. And I could see real clearly that these two are on a collision course, inevitably. And so I watched it happen. It was like a, a train wreck. I could see it coming, but there was nothing I could do to stop it. And Deacon, sure enough, as she rounded the corner, hit the side of that woman's tray. Plates flew everywhere. The restaurant fell silent. And Deacon had hit the, the side of that woman's tray with such force Knocked him out cold. <laughs> I watched from a distance as his little knees buckled. He, he piled up in the floor there in a, little, in a little pile, out like a light. And by the time I got over to him, he had come to, he'd begun to wake up a little bit, and it became clear to me that he wasn't going to die or anything. He was okay. And so the second good parenting decision I make in this story, you know what I said like every dad does? Suck it up, man. Like, uh, let's go. <laughs> go sit with your mom. Well, I comfort this lady who is now crying hysterically and speaking very fast in a language that I did not understand. I told her everything was going to be okay. So I go and I sit with my wife and Deacon, who's not shed a tear up to this point. I hear now that he begins to sob. It burns, it burns. And I look over and he has begun to bleed profusely from his forehead. And it's in his eyeballs and it's dripping down his nose. And it's in his teeth, it's dripping down. It looks like a horror movie. And it becomes clear that I'm going to have to take this kid for the first time in his life to the emergency room. And we did. He got some stitches inside and out, right between his eyes, and they healed. But when we got the stitches out, it left a little mark in the shape of a lightning bolt like Harry Potter, right between his eyes. And sometimes even now, he's taller than I am, and I look up at him, and it's faint, but I can see it, and it reminds me of that story. The scar's still there, and it reminds me of the story about that little boy that time at that Mexican restaurant. And, and the truth is, most of us have scar stories, don't we? But not all of them are cute like that. They're not all funny, are they? Some of you, some of you got some scar stories, and it's not some cute story because what the scar that it left you with is a lot of regret and some guilt and some shame maybe even because at some point in life you were on a collision course. And maybe some people that loved you at that time, they tried to warn you. And they could see it coming because of the choices that you were making, maybe the choices the people around you were making. They could see the collision coming, but despite their warning, there was nothing they could do to stop it, and you had a crash. And it left a scar, and it's not some cute story. It's a scar that's on your heart. And there's regret, and there's guilt, and there's, there's shame maybe. And that's what happened for this lady in the story today. Sweet lady, and I love this story. I do. But she had a collision. Maybe over and over again, she had a collision, and it had left her brokenhearted, I believe, because of the time she lived in, maybe even scarred physically, it doesn't say. But she comes there that day and she meets her Lord Jesus. She gets really honest with him about her scars. She walks away knowing that she will never be scarred again. She was healed forever by the Lord Jesus. One other quick story as we're getting started. Some years ago I served at a church in South Carolina. 
and we sponsored some orphanages. And part of my job was to go to Kenya. Almost every year we would go to Kenya, sometimes more than one time a year, to sort of check on things. And I became lifelong, really good friends with this pastor there named Bernard. And we would go to Kenya, but sometimes Bernard would come and he would see us in America. And this one time, or when he would come, it was my job to sort of take care of him when he would come. I would host him for the weeks that he was here. And I would drive him to his speaking engagements and other really important things, like making sure he got to ride on speedboats, tricking him into riding roller coasters at Carowinds, you know, stuff like that. But this one trip, he brought his wife, Pamela. Pamela was a sweet lady, but she had never left her Kenyan home. And the United States was a little overwhelming for her, I believe. But we'd taken them out to eat at this big shopping center in Charlotte. And the centerpiece of that shopping center was a fountain, big multi-tiered, huge fountain. And we sat there eating dinner, and, and Pamela was a woman of very few words anyway. She kind of stared out the window where we could see that fountain. And we're almost through the meal, and she looked at me. She said, Pasta Jesse. That's what she called me. I'll stop my Kenyan accent right there. That's the last time I'm going to do it. She said, Pastor Jesse. She said, may I ask you a question? And I said, of course. Anything, Pamela. She said, where are the women? I said, what women, Pamela? What do you mean? She pointed out at that well. She said, where are that fountain? She said, where are the women who come to draw water from this well? It's a funny answer. Funny question, I mean. But a poignant one, isn't it? Really sweet. Just it reminded me in that moment of all that we take for granted and, and that which is so precious and life-giving. And she understood that in a way I never could. While I'm over here wasting water so my grass is greener and my truck is cleaner, I have to explain to this sweet Kenyan woman, oh, oh no, Pamela, we can't drink any of that water. Somebody just paid about $50,000 so we could sit here and look at it, right? This woman that we're going to look at today, she comes to the well that day. Thirsty? And she comes empty, and she finds the Lord Jesus waiting on her there. And he fills her, and she would not be thirsty again. She would not take water for granted again. So we're going to begin in John chapter 4. Here's what it says. Verse 1, now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. That was his cousin, John the Baptist. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but it was his disciples that were doing the baptizing. In verse 3, so he left Judea and he went back once more to Galilee. Jesus is trying here to stay clear of the drama. How many of you would say that your life's goal right now is just to stay clear of the drama? Save the drama for your mama. That's what Jesus is doing, amen. The Pharisees are always trying to start drama for Jesus. Trying to create this competitive vibe between him and his his cousin John. And Jesus wants no part of it. So Jesus says, I'm leaving town. I'm leaving Judea, and, and I'm going to head to Galilee. And in verse 4, it's a really short verse, but it's a very significant verse for this story. It says in verse 4, Now he had to go through Samaria. What does it mean that he had to go through Samaria? Because a couple things. One, Jesus is Jesus, and he doesn't have to do anything. But number two, the Jewish people, when they went to Galilee, they didn't have to go through Samaria. Most of them went around. Pharisees would never have gone through Samaria to get to Galilee. And the reason why is the Jewish people hated the Samaritans. And it goes back hundreds of years at this point. I think we talked about it some last week even. To when the Assyrians came and they invaded and conquered the northern kingdom. And they sent the Gentiles to live there among the Jews. They intermarried there and they, they created this mashup of a religion of paganism and, and Judaism. They even kind of had their own New Testament, and they built a temple there, and they intermarried there, and this new race of people was called Samaritans, and the Jewish people hated them. They looked at them as, as social and religious and physical half-breed people. Impure, apostate throwaways. And no Pharisee would ever choose pass through Samaria. In fact, here's what they would do. There's a map coming. Most of you can see. At the bottom, this is where Jesus is. He's in Judea. And you can see Galilee's way up there. And it's not hard to see. I'm not a great map reader. You know, we have GPS now. But in between there is Samaria. And that's very clearly the shortest route. But here's what most of the Pharisees would do. They would walk to the, to the edge there. You can see where the red arrow goes around. They would travel east across the Jordan River. 
it was much hotter that way. The terrain was much worse. It took them nearly two full extra days. I'll drive around the parking lot at Walmart for 20 minutes to save 30 feet in, in the parking lot in the summertime, right? These people hated the Samaritans so much they walked two extra days in the Middle Eastern heat just to get around so they wouldn't have to come in contact with the Samaritan person. It was classism, and it was religious discrimination, and it was racism of the worst kind. Pharisees taught that no Samaritan could ever fully be loved by God. And that no Samaritan person could ever inherit the kingdom of God. And that, friends, is why I believe that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Not because there wasn't another way around there. There was another way around. Jesus has to go through Samaria because he knew that he had set a divine appointment with a broken-hearted lady at the edge of the well. And she didn't know it yet, but in his sovereignty, he did. He had a divine appointment with a lady so that he could demonstrate to his disciples, I believe, and to that woman and the Samaritan people and to the Pharisees that because he was here, there doesn't have to be any division because of class or race or even religion anymore because he had come to redeem broken and scarred up people like the woman in this story. In verse 5, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Jacob's well, I looked it up this week. It is unquestionably, at least according to Wikipedia, the, the most verifiable site in all the Holy Land. It's still there. Much of the time, even sometimes it has water still. And it says, and Jesus, tired as he was from his journey. I love that, that Jesus gets tired. I mean, of course he's tired. He's been walking for two days and it's hot. But Jesus' divinity will be on full display for the rest of this story. But I think it's good to have this reminder right here that he was human too. And he was tired from his journey and he sat down by the well and it was about noon. Midday. See, people didn't come to the well at midday. Midday was not a busy time at Jacob's well. The women would come to draw water from the well, but they would come early in the morning. They would come six or seven in the evening when it was a little bit cooler. Nobody would come to draw a well in the middle of the hottest part of the day unless maybe they didn't want to be seen. Unless maybe they were trying to avoid the crowd for some reason. In verse 7, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Love that. He sends his disciples away. He sends his disciples away because he knows he has a divine appointment. And he sits there by the edge of the well and he waits on her to get there and his appointment has arrived. Almost. Several social rules are broken right here. First, the Jewish people didn't talk to Samaritan people, period. Second, a rabbi, which is, which is, which is what they believed Jesus to be. That's how they saw Jesus. A rabbi would never speak to a woman, Jewish or not, in public, period. And, and third, Jewish people didn't eat Samaritan food. Pharisees taught that, that Samaritan food was more detestable for the Jewish people even than swine's flesh. Yet Jesus sends his boys into town. And I imagine his disciples were kind of thinking, you know, what were we thinking, Jesus? I mean, could we not have just packed a lunch? I mean, are you trying to start something? Are you trying to get us in trouble? We don't want to get in a fight, but these people hate us, Jesus. And for good reason, probably, because they think we hate them too. And I think right here, this Samaritan woman maybe has her own kind of what were you thinking Jesus moment. Because Jesus had asked her for a drink. And here's what she says, verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew. She could tell, you're a Jew. And I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me? for a drink, for Jews to not associate with Samaritans. 
See, I think that Jesus asks this woman for a drink, not because he's thirsty. I think he asks this woman for a drink because he knows that she is thirsty, don't you think? I mean, why else would she be there like this in the middle of the hottest part of the day unless she felt like she needed to be alone? Unless maybe she was trying to avoid having to hear the whispers that she had probably heard many times as a result of the reputation that very likely she had earned, frankly, for herself in this little town. Verse 10, Jesus answers her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. See, we're going to find out in just a minute. This woman had lived pretty rough, I think. Life had not been easy for her. Maybe because of her own choices, probably. Maybe because of some choices that people in her life made on her behalf. I don't know exactly. But I think her life had been hard. And like a lot of people who have lived hard, and you know some people like this, sometimes people who have lived hard have a little bit of a hard edge to them, don't they? A little bit of tone, a little bit of attitude maybe. You ever been to a diner? Might be like the Waffle House, no offense, Waffle House employees. And you get that one waitress that very clearly doesn't want to be there. All business. No small talk at all. I was out of town with some, some guys one time. We went to the Waffle House, and we got that waitress. She came to the table. She said, what do you want? It's as friendly as she got the whole time. And, and I got this buddy, and he's just kind of that guy, you know. If there's a way to complicate an order in an annoying way, he's just going to order that. He says, I would like some half and half tea, and you could feel the woman roll her eyes, you know. I would like a, a cheeseburger, but instead of a bun, I would like it on toast, and I would like for you to put the tomato and the lettuce on the side because I don't want to make the bread soggy. And I would like the hash browns, but I want them really, really crispy because like, like last time I ordered them really crispy, but they didn't come out really crispy, and then I had to send them back, and I don't want to have that to happen this time. He said, I, I hope that's not too much trouble. <laughs> and she said, no, honey, it's not too much trouble. As a matter of fact... When the food comes out, why don't you just slide over in the booth and I'll sit there and feed it to you. That's what she said. <laughs> it's a true story. That woman had an edge to her. <laughs> and I don't know. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say, to be clear. I don't want to take too much liberty. And maybe not an edge to that degree, an attitude to that great degree, but I believe this woman had lived hard and I think she had a little bit of an edge to her. Verse 11. Sir, the woman says, you can almost hear that this is, feels like a smart elk cancer. Sir, the woman says, you have nothing to draw with. You want some water? You have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where can you get this living water? And, and who do you think you are anyway? Who do you think you are? Are you greater than our father Jacob? who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock. little sassiness there with Jesus, I think, maybe. I don't know. And I think maybe, it doesn't say, but maybe. Right here, I think that Jesus may stop and I think maybe he, he grinned at her a little. And I think maybe that he looks right into her soul in a way that only he could. And he answers, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Then the woman said to him, I, I think maybe still with a little Tone to her voice, well, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. In the middle of the day, the hottest part, all alone so that I don't have to deal with anybody and so that nobody has to deal with me either. And I think maybe at this point, I think maybe at this point she spins on her heels to walk away because Jesus calls to her. He says, he says, go call your husband. 
come back. She said, I have no husband. She replied. Jesus said to her, you're right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you've had five husbands, haven't you? This man that you have now, he's not even your husband, is he? What you have said is quite true. It gets really personal, doesn't it? I, it's like this, the whole reason she's come here in the middle of the day like this is so that she can avoid having to have conversations like this one. Yet here's this man, this Jewish man who waits for her there. And, and isn't it true in this moment that if we didn't know the end of this story, and that if you and I didn't know the Lord Jesus like you and I know the Lord Jesus, isn't it true in this moment that we would think it cruel of him, wouldn't we? Psalm 34, 8 says that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. People like this woman, that he rescues those who are crushed in spirit. This doesn't feel like a rescue, not yet. Psalm 147, 3 says he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. Yet Jesus does not heal this woman's broken heart. Not yet. Not yet. She's come in the middle of the day. Because she doesn't want to have to deal with her scars. And here's Jesus sovereignly. She doesn't get that yet. But sovereignly knowing every rotten thing this woman has ever done. And everything that has been done to her. He knows her wounds. The depths of her scar. He knows it all. And instead like we would assume from the Lord Jesus. Instead of applying a bandage to cover her wound. Instead in this moment he rips it off doesn't he? exposes this woman, just lays her bare right there in a way that only he could. But it's not cruelty. It's just tough love. And here's what Jesus knows. And it's true for this sweet woman in this story. And it is true for me and you is that we cannot be fully healed until we are fully honest. About our scars. We got some, don't we? We got some scars. Some of you have been trying to get past some scars for a really long time. There's some decisions you made a long time ago, and it has defined you up to this point. You have tried to live it down, you have tried to ignore it, but the truth is the scar is still there. There's still a woundedness there. Because of sin, maybe a secret sin, maybe some habit. That you have not been able to kick and you're doing everything you can to keep people from finding out about it. But let me tell you something. He knows. He knows. He loves you. But he knows. And I think, I think for some of you in this morning, in, in here this morning, maybe that he has set a divine appointment with you just like he did with that lady. He wants to heal your heart today. First, he must expose your wound. And that's uncomfortable for us. It's uncomfortable. But he knows. He gets really personal with this woman. And it's too personal for her, I think. Because what, what do you and I do when somebody's probing a little too much? You know, it gets a little more personal than we're comfortable with, asking some questions that we find a bit nosy. We change the subject, and that's kind of what she does. Verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. I mean, you got me, okay? I'm a sinful woman. You must be some kind of holy man. But the truth is you wouldn't have to be because everybody in this town already knows that about me. And I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk with them about it. I don't want to talk with you. So can we talk about something else in verse 20? Our ancestors, she says, they worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, but we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now has come. 
when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus says it's not about mountains anymore. It's not about temples anymore. It's not about race or bloodlines anymore. It is about the condition of your heart and whether or not you believe that I am who I say that I am. Because that's when worship happens. When, When his truth, the truth of the gospel gets written on your heart and the Holy Spirit of the living God ignites in you the spirit that was dead and brings it to life. We respond in worship in spirit and in truth. Here's an equation I heard from a pastor a long time ago is that, that, that your truth plus his truth equals your freedom. Your truth meaning the truth about you, the truth about your scars, the truth about your wounds and the sins that caused them. When that gets matched up with the truth about him and what he wants for you, the fact that he loves you more than you could ever know, That he chose to come and to live perfectly and to die for you. Subsequently to be risen again. And the gift of grace that he wants to bestow on you. That will heal your heart like nothing else could. When your truth gets matched up with his truth, it equals your freedom. And that equation right there is about to change this woman's life. I mean, you can almost see it in the story, can't you? That the light is coming on in this woman's soul just a little bit. Jesus has has confronted her flatly with her truth. But because we know what we know about Jesus, you can see that her freedom's just around the corner. To this woman, she's gone in such a short time. From hard edge to... Who do you think you are anyway, sir? Sir? You better than our father Jacob? I think she's softening a bit, doesn't say. I think maybe her guard's coming down a little bit. Now she's thinking, could it be? I mean, are are you? I mean, surely not, but, but maybe it seems like Could it be that you're the one? Could it be that you're the the promised one that that my ancestors have told me about? It couldn't be possible. But maybe. Then this woman goes fishing, I believe, for an answer. Without actually ever asking a question. In verse 25, the woman said. She says, I know that Messiah... Called Christ, he's coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then, gloriously, for the first time to anyone on planet Earth. The very first time that we know of. Verse 26. Since then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am amazing, isn't it? I've read that maybe literally a thousand times and I love it every time. It's one of the the greatest lines in all of the Bible to me. Because he chooses her. It tells us so much, doesn't it? It tells us so much about the heart of our Lord Jesus. He chooses her. The Apostle Paul, he was alive at this point. The Apostle Paul would go on to be inspired to write the very words of Scripture. Jesus could have made a divine appointment with him to reveal this information. But he doesn't. Not yet. What about these men, these disciples that Jesus has been living with and pouring his life into? Peter, he says, upon this rock I will build my church. And James and John, he calls them the sons of thunder. Courageous men that he would empower and equip and entrust with his gospel. 
to establish his church in all the world in his absence. He sent them to town because he had a divine appointment to share the most important truth in the history of the universe before or since with this broken and forgotten, scarred-hearted Samaritan woman. He chooses her. And that's why I think that he had to go through Samaria. He had an appointment there. And he exposes her truth. He rips off her band-aid and exposes her truth. And then he reveals his truth. And it's just about to equal her freedom. And Jesus' timing is impeccable. Because as soon as he reveals himself to this woman, the disciples come walking up. Verse 27. Just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But nobody asked, what do you want? Why are you talking to her? They knew better, I think. And in verse 28, then leaving her water jar. Leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? It's beautiful that she comes to the well that day carrying this heavy earthen symbol that represented all of her emptiness. She comes carrying this jar that represents her thirst. And then she meets the Lord Jesus who waits there for her by the edge of that well. And upon meeting him, she sets her jar down. She leaves it behind and she walks away. Because she knows that she'll never be empty again. She'll never be thirsty again. Let me ask you this question. What causes emptiness? What causes emptiness? Isn't it true for a lot of us that that in our quietest moments, we know that there's something in us that's missing. There, there's something in us that isn't quite right. There's a void there. And, and despite our very best efforts to fill it, there's still an emptiness there. We know it. It's why a lot of us have jumped from relationship for, to relationship with people that we knew probably weren't good for us to start. We stayed longer than we should have stayed trying to fill a void. Trying to be whole. In all the wrong places we, we have looked for that. How many of you have been there? It's why people work harder than they should to buy a whole lot of stuff that they don't need. I value hard work. I respect that we should work hard. It's an American thing, right? This is a work ethic thing. We're proud of that. But I think a lot of times our work ethic, our, our workaholism is just a mask for the fact that we know if we sit still too long, we're going to have to be confronted with the fact that there's something missing in us. It's why people drink too much. And become addicted to drugs. It's why we eat too much. It's why we buy our dream house and then six months later realize that's not really a dream house. We want another dream house. And another one and another. Because it's never enough. There is nothing in all of this world. Nothing. That can satisfy that void. Fill that emptiness. Apart from Jesus. There's just nothing. I'll tell you a story. It's a corny preacher story, but I'm going to tell you anyway. When I was in the seventh grade, I was in the band. I hated it, just so you know. I wasn't in there for very long. I was like the 17th chair trombone in the seventh grade band. And I never practiced, and it didn't last very long. I later sold that trombone to buy a shotgun. That's a true story. <laughs> the guy I sold it to is a music minister now. You can look it up. Anyway... So good for him. It worked out for him. Uh, but we used to have to play these songs. And we weren't good at anything. We, had, we used to have to play songs like a Hot Cross Buns. You remember that? What's that about? It doesn't even sound appropriate, I don't think. Well, I don't know what a Hot Cross Bun is. 
I remember one time for a grade in front of all my peers, I had to stand there with my trombone and play this dumb song called uh, There's a Hole in My Bucket. Do you remember this song? There's a hole in the bucket. Dear Liza, dear Liza, there's a hole in my bucket. And it's this song about this pitiful guy who's got a hole in his bucket. And he tries everything he knows to fill the bucket so he can win over this girl named Liza. And I'm like, look, dude, Liza wants a more confident man than that. You sound really pitiful. Your, 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 beta, your beta male whininess is never going to win over this woman. But anyway, he had a, a leaky bucket. <laughs> I told you it was a corny illustration. Bear with me. Here's the deal, and you know where I'm going with that. Our hearts are like leaky buckets, aren't they? And we can try everything to patch and to fill, and the truth is they still leak apart from Jesus. Everything this world has to offer only always leads to more thirstiness and more emptiness. King Solomon, the wisest and the wealthiest man that ever lived. We look at Elon Musk. He's kind of that guy for us right now, right? He's really smart. He's doing amazing things. He is the wealthiest man in the world. He had nothing on this Solomon guy, okay? God had gifted him. He's the wisest man that ever lived. He had riches and wealth that were unfathomable then and even now and he built palaces and temples and mansions and he had these public works projects like the world had never known the bible says unlimited food and wine and unbridled sexual encounters is what it says and he tried it all searching for purpose for meaning Ecclesiastes 2.9 says, I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. And all my wisdom has stayed with me, and I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and when I had, what I had a toil to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Whatever it is that you think that you're chasing after, whatever you've got the money to, to pursue and to try, I'll tell you, Solomon tried it all already. Times a million. And here's what he found. Empty. It was leaky. It did not satisfy. And Solomon gets old. He spends his life chasing after all that stuff that was meaningless. And empty, and he gets old, and in Ecclesiastes 12, it says, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. That's what it boils down to. All that other stuff, waste of time. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. I've tried all that other stuff, I'm telling you. It didn't work out for me. Here's what I know as an old man. Fear God and keep his commandments. You and I were created to walk in perfect relationship with the Lord Jesus. We just were. In any life lived apart from that, it's empty. It leaves us thirsty. Here's what I've been praying for you today and for, for this week. Is that for some of you, for some of you today, that you would understand that maybe God really has set a divine appointment that you would be here and that he would meet you here. I believe he's here with us. And that you could get really honest about your truth. About your scars and about the sin that caused them. And that your truth could get matched up with his truth about what it is he wants to do for you. And for the first time today, some of you could begin to walk in freedom and healing like you've never known. Psalm 107 says, for he satisfies the thirsty. Some of you are still thirsty this morning. And he, he fills the hunger with good things. And he wants to do that for you. Isaiah 55 says, is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come and take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why waste your life and your resources on things that you know are empty why pay for food that does you no good listen to me 
You will eat what is good and you will enjoy the finest food. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen. Listen to him. Find life. When Jesus stood up to give the greatest sermon that's ever been preached. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. He says, blessed are those that mourn because they know something's not right. Blessed are those that mourn because they're honest about the fact that they don't have it all together. Blessed are those that mourn because they know that something's broken that only he can fix. He says, blessed are those in Matthew 5, 6 who hunger and who thirst for righteousness. For they will be filled. Let me tell you something. When you thirst for what God wants from you, you will be filled every time. He gives it freely. He doesn't withhold that from you. John 7, Jesus stands up at this big party. This is an invitation for you. Right now in this room, 37, verse 37 says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Revelation 22 says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. I believe that he speaks those very words to some of you this morning. And maybe you've heard them a thousand times before, but like that woman at the well, that light in your soul maybe is beginning to come on just a little bit. You've spent your life trying to fill the void with Everything this life has to offer, this world has to offer, but it's left you empty. Right now, would you respond to this invitation from Jesus? Because if you knew who it was that was offering you this gift, you would ask him for a drink. And he would give you living water. He wants to give you living water today enjoyed today's sermon and would like to be part of Authentic Church, go ahead and take the next step and sign up for our next steps online. You can live anywhere in the world and still be part of Authentic Church. Also, I want to say thank you so much for watching today. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to either subscribe or follow to any of our social media accounts so that you can see any new content that will be uploaded. And if you'd like to give to this church to help us financially, go ahead and click that give button down below to help us reach more people for Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again very soon.